On this week's episode, I talk about how to manage productivity when you don't use timesheets. Welcome back to episode 16 of Weekly Q&A with Steph. Last week on my nice little intro video, I mentioned we were talking about capacity planning, budgeting and timesheets. And apparently a lot of you um, commented and have come back to me and said, I clearly dislike timesheets just by my mannerisms and my eyebrow raise when I say that question or say that word. It's a really interesting concept and an argument that I've had with so many accountants over the last few years about whether timesheets have a place in a business, what they are actually utilised for, and what are the pros and cons of still doing them in your business. And this has to be looked at from two ways. So timesheets from a productivity point of view and actually looking at what you're doing and the output and whether you're improving, etc are not a bad idea. It's a difficult thing to actually do sometimes, but it's certainly not a, a bad thing in your business. Timesheets in looking at what you're physically going to bill someone is a very, very different story and something we might talk about in future. But I really want to look at how you actually look at productivity in your business if you're not using timesheets, because it's something that I keep getting asked over and over again. So we used to use timesheets originally at GrowthWise. We all attend attempted to do them very well. None of us ever tried to fudge our timesheets. And, you know, it worked okay. We could see if a financial statements preparation was taking four hours and the next year if it was actually taking three hours. And it was good to be able to do those comparisons at whether the improvements we had made, whether the systems we had implemented were actually helping our business. But as the years progressed and as we got more and more people and as we started to do more and more non-traditional compliance style work, it's very difficult to do timesheets when you're doing five minutes here to help somebody and 20 minutes there to do a small task, as opposed to those big jobs that you're working on for three to four hours at a time. But one of the biggest issues we had when we started to look at this was how do we track productivity? How do we actually know if you know, Christy is actually producing the same amount of output as what Alan is, as what Andrew is, etc. And this is something we struggled with to start with. I think we now have nailed, and a lot of people that I talk to about this are starting to utilise similar methods for them as well. And for us, it's all about the output of tasks or the output of jobs, depending on what time of the year it is and depending on whom it is that we're looking at from a productivity perspective. So we always set targets and we set goals of when we would like to have our compliance work finished by, when we would like to have tax planning finished by, when we would like to have end of month style jobs finished by. And I work backwards in terms of, do we have enough people to actually physically do this task? Now, July, August and September is a, a quite an easy time to measure productivity because for the most part, we are looking at how many sets of financial statements we can actually complete in a given week. Now, we use that as our benchmark. We don't necessarily concentrate on producing financial statements as our key KPI, but we use that as a benchmark for actually doing the productivity test to see are we getting through enough work and are we getting through this work quick enough for what we actually think as a business. Now, our aim for the most part is to actually get through anywhere between 10 to 12 sets of financial statements for every single accountant that we actually have in the office. Now, that's easy for us to look at because we've done most of the work during the year. By the time this time of year comes around in terms of tax planning, we have done a lot of the work. It's just tidy up for the end part. Then obviously we're looking at things like setting budgets, doing all those wonderful things, and we've kind of worked backwards in that we can do somewhere between 10 to 12 sets of financial statements every single week. So it's easy for us to start to measure productivity, and we ask the question. So every single day we actually ask the question of, what are you doing in the morning using gel, goes into Slack, and what you didn't get done today that you thought you would get done. Now, we leave this up to the individual people to set their own workflow in terms of what days they're actually going to do what and when they're going to get these things done. But at the end of the week, we always measure output. 
How many sets of financials, as an example, did you get done? How many sets of tax planning finalisations did you get done at this stage? And if you didn't hit 12, why? And maybe it was a case of this week we did three of our biggest clients, which we obviously charge a lot more and we were never going to get 12 done in a week, but we have that conversation. And I think for, for all intensive purposes, that is the key. Setting some good, simple targets to start with. It's great from a capacity planning point of view when you're setting when you need to bring on new team members, etc. But actually having those conversations as to why. It's a great way to look at improvement. It's a great way to look at what you need to do next year, as an example with this client, what you could do right now. But it all comes back to that communication and working on is this still feasible? How could we get 12 to 13, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you're thinking about turning off timesheets and you're really worried about how you're going to track productivity, maybe it's best to do a combination. Keep the timesheets going for a little three month period, six month period, but also track the output and you'll be surprised how easy it is then to turn the timesheets off and just go with the output. So that's a wrap on episode 16 of Weekly Q&A with Steph. I hope you've been enjoying the series. As always, keep your questions coming. Don't forget to press the subscribe button so you never miss an episode.